Welcome to the global seminar of the Global Columbia Collaboratory. I am Shannon Marquez, Dean for Undergraduate Global Engagement at Columbia University. And I'm so excited that you joined us today for a conversation about the future of higher education. Now, since higher education has been faced with a comprehensive recalibration as a result of many factors, including the pandemic, it is indeed an honor to have a panel of distinguished experts here with us, stepping into the Global Columbia Collaboratory to have a robust discussion about this important topic. With the disruption caused by the pandemic, the Columbia University Center for Undergraduate Global Engagement, in partnership with Columbia Global Centers and Columbia World Projects, launched the Global Columbia Collaboratory as a virtual exchange initiative to support students around the world. The collaboratory brings students, thought leaders, and educators together. It promotes cross-cultural collaboration and communication and enhances skills and good global competency to allow students to reflect, ideate, and collaborate to empower them to make a difference in the world. Students participate from 23 countries and are drawn from all three undergraduate schools at Columbia, representing over 30 majors. And we also have students participate from dual degree programs, such as Sciences Po in Paris and Trinity College Dublin. Using smartphones and laptops to access the Collaboratory Virtual Exchange platform, students form a community of global thinkers and problem solvers through participation in theme global seminars featuring international speakers such as our seminar today, as well as facilitated reflection, ideation, and collaboration activities. As learnings and perspectives are shared across the collaboratory, students are encouraged to collaborate to support the further development of ideas into projects that have the potential to address the most urgent challenges of our time. Students then form project teams and receive funding to tackle specific global issues and topics of interest. And their work is featured in an online gallery. Now, we are thrilled that over 260 students participants have been actively engaged in the collaboratory since it launched last summer, including undergraduate students, observers, graduate student assistants, and we currently have a spring semester cohort of collaboratory students joining us live today from around the world, including a group of Columbia Engineering Entrepreneurship Design Challenge students who are developing interdisciplinary technology driven solutions as part of their experience in the collaboratory. Welcome to all of you. Now, some of our students will ask questions to our panelists today, and I encourage the global audience to also submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Again, I want to welcome everyone to this Global Columbia Collaboratory Seminar, and I want to thank all of our partners and our esteemed panelists. We are so pleased to be working directly with the Columbia Global Centers for these seminars. And at this time, I want to introduce Safwan Masri, Columbia University Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development, who will introduce us to our panelists today. Safwan? Thank you, Shana, and thank you. I could not be more pleased uh, to really be joined today by two dear friends and luminaries in the fields of higher education, in particular global uh, higher education. Alan and Marriott, it really is a special treat to, to be sharing the stage with you. Um, I can't think of anybody, I could not think of anybody better than either of you uh, to be engaged in this discussion um, on the future of higher education. Uh, before we jump into it, let me just make a couple of remarks um, as one reflects on this past year and what it means and what the future might hold. Uh, you know, I found myself thinking how many times over the centuries have philosophers pronounced that the only way to truly become an educated person is to toss out everything we think we know and begin again, this time with open eyes. It isn't necessary to become an apologist for the pandemic to note that as people who are profoundly invested in the future of education, this past year has given us ample opportunity to reassess our practices and re-examine our assumptions. It has now been one year since Columbia University, for example, transitioned to hybrid and online classes a time frame that can function as both structure and plot device, like Thoreau at Walden Pond. Now, having cycled through the seasons, we emerge from our experiment in the metaphorical woods, and it is spring in a new world, one of the silver linings of this pandemic. What makes this time in higher education new, one might ask? The landscape of education has been reshaped. As schools have closed or moved to remote instruction or developed hybrid models, 
the panoply of pre-existing issues has emerged into new light. The inequalities of resources, of expectations, of exposure, and of access that have been so publicly revealed are troubling, dividing protests and furthering political divisions, sorry, driving protests and furthering political divisions. While there is an understandable eagerness to get some semblance of our old lives back, our primary task as educators is always to move forward, incorporating more information and understanding as we go. What can be learned from the massive disruption to our educational systems caused by the pandemic? In addition to the increased awareness of inequities and competing needs across student populations, we have witnessed incredible shifts in methodology. There have been technological advances that have fostered new mode models for teaching and participating, bringing with them new concepts of what a classroom might be and new tools for taking learning outside of the school environment. These developments do not necessarily address the divisions that enable or prevent student engagement. In some cases, technology exacerbates the inequalities, but the tools now exist and are in use and have already altered the school experience and our collective expectations about education and what it looks like or how it is to be achieved. In higher education, the pandemic has meant that we begin to understand the global nature of student populations in new ways. During the past year, as my colleagues here know, Colombia established nine pop-up centers throughout the world to complement our existing infrastructure of nine permanent global centers. The purpose was to better support international students who were suddenly and unexpectedly unable to return to the United States, who felt disconnected from the wider campus of New York City and the United States, including those imposed by multiple time zones. This experiment, born of necessity, has invited all of us to question how education is conducted through space and time and how we build sustainable university-wide connections when so many don't have access to a centralized physical location. What was assembled in response to the immediate demands of an emergency is now understood as merely the first step in addressing the broader needs of an increasingly global student body within a world of shifting norms. New restrictions on international mobility, increased prejudice and nationalism, pressure from governments and governmental institutions to restrict academic freedoms, and economic downturns that impact regional job prospects are all going to be factors in these students' lives and therefore are going to shape the educational landscape. How can higher education simultaneously adapt and proactively plan so that students are equipped to create and lead in this new world? Culturally, education provides a sense of tradition, a permanent feature of life across generations. Of course, education is also the source of innovation, and it has changed greatly over time. However, we do not normally have so much change forced upon us so suddenly or dramatically or with such high stakes. The global nature of the pandemic helped us to see more clearly the inherently global nature of higher education and our need to take this into account as we emerge from our year in the wilderness. This webinar, will now address the need to be increasingly nimble and adaptable in university operations and in pedagogy as we grapple with student mobility, differing national responses to contemporary issues and the realities of social, economic and technological inequities in a highly politicized environment. How will we take advantage of this moment to reinvent the ways in which universities engage with the world? while also remaining a source of stability as we move into the future? How can education become a greater source for knowledge diplomacy to advance human welfare by merging the university's distinctive intellectual capabilities with non-academic organizations committed to affecting change? So to help us answer these very simple questions um, and a lot more, uh, we have with us two really extraordinary scholars and educators. Marriott Westerman is Vice Chancellor of the New York University Abu Dhabi campus. Prior to this, Marriott was the Executive Vice President for Programs and Research at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. In that role, 
Marriott launched initiatives that study and promote the value of the humanities and the liberal arts, strengthen community colleges, encourage graduate education reform, renew preservation of cultural heritage around the world, and support scholars and artists at risk. And I am privileged to have worked with Marriott on establishing the Mellon Fellowship Program for Displaced Scholars, which is in its second very successful pilot year at the Amman Global Center, where we host a number of uh, scholars at risk from, uh, from around the region, around the world. And it complements work that we have been doing with the International Institute of Education and Alan Goodman's uh, Scholars Rescue Fund. We maybe will talk about that during the, the uh, discussion. Prior to the foundation, Marriott was on the faculty of New York University, first as director of the Institute of Fine Arts, and then as the first provost of, provost of New York University Abu Dhabi. Before joining NYU in 2002, Marriott was associate director of research at the Clark Art Institute. And from 1995 to 2001, she was an assistant and then associate professor of art history at Rutgers University. She received her undergraduate degree magna cum laude from Williams College, where she was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. Marriott also received her master's and her PhD from NYU's Institute of Fine Arts. Really great to see you, Marriott. Alan Goodman, Alan Goodman is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, a founding member of the World Innovation Summit for Education, and serves on the selection committees for the Rhodes and Schwarzman Scholars and the Wise and Gidan Prizes. Dr. Goodman has a PhD in government from Harvard, a master's in public affairs from the John F. Kennedy School of Government, and a bachelor of science from Northwestern University. He received decorations for his work in promoting educational exchange and scholar, scholar rescue work from the government of France, governments of France, Germany, and Norway. And Alan has received the first Gilbert Medal from the Universitatis 21 organization. Before joining the Institute for International Education, where he is the head, uh, president, and CEO, Dr. Goodman was executive dean of the School of Foreign Service and professor at Georgetown University. He has served at the Department of State and the Central Intelligence Agency. So welcome to you, Alan. Welcome to you, Marriott. And um, let me start by posing a couple of questions uh, to you. Um, to both of you. So Alan, based on your extensive experience and from your work with IIE, will US universities remain a magnet for international students in the future? Or have anti-globalization nativist events of recent years and the disruptions caused by the pandemic reduced the appeal of these institutions? And for you, Marriott, um, a question on the international presence of large research universities. What has the experience of the last decade taught us about the future of seeding branch campuses around the world? Will such campuses become integral components of the great universities, or are they destined to remain as small extensions of their sponsoring institutions? And here I'm talking broadly, because NYU is a special case in that uh, it thinks of itself in terms of Washington Square, Abu Dhabi, and Shanghai, uh, not Washington Square with branches around the world. Um, so to both of you, the question of international students, the appeal of our great research universities for international students in the United States, right? And then also our foray into the world. So our ability to attract people into the United States and our ability and maybe necessity to go out in the world and attract students locally, regionally, and globally. Um, I'll start with you, Marriott. I so was just going to say, to start with that. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Safwan and uh, Shannon, for having us here. It's great to be with uh, both Alan and Safwan on this panel. And of course, for me, as a New York University creature, it's great to be in the other great University of New York. Because as you've said, Safwan, um, NYU Abu Dhabi and our sibling NYU Shanghai that started about two years after us, we opened in 2010, are fully integrated into New York University. And that's often 
a hard concept to think about. And we are a little bit unique, but in some ways, Colombia has taken a somewhat similar path through all these magnificent sites that you've opened and run and that we work with uh, as well. So when I reflect on the creation of NYU Abu Dhabi between 2007 and 2010 and how it's now, how we've now had it for 11 years and we're about to graduate our eighth class, um, I think first of all, you can say, well, uh, that university in the UAE, in the United Arab Emirates, always had to do three things. It was created not just as a whim of NYU, it was created at the invitation and with the partnership of the government of Abu Dhabi, which is the capital emirate of the UAE. And so we were always styled from the very beginning as a university in and of Abu Dhabi and the UAE, in and of New York University as a global research enterprise and the largest private university in the United States, and in and of the world. So what does that mean? I think I should briefly describe our campus because it will begin to make more sense. We were never just a study away site. We were created as a degree granting university in its own right, but also one that would be started up in a region that didn't have really a liberal arts driven or certainly country, a liberal arts driven research university of an international character. So what NYU brought to the table was the intellectual startup capital and the operational wherewithal to build a really high quality university quickly. And a university that promised to grant NYU degrees abroad in the UAE. We had the confidence to say, we think we can bring the NYU quality, which was on a constant upswing, you'll remember over the last 20 years, we will bring that quality there and teach students that we will recruit local students, but also international students from around the world, just as well as we do in New York, and maybe even better because we will be a smaller startup liberal arts type college that we envelop in the full plenitude of the research quality of NYU. That was the gambit. It was a big wager. We had a very enthusiastic president, John Saxon, who made a lot of promises. And I was there as first provost and first employee of this new entity to deliver it. So I was sometimes worried that we wouldn't really meet all these demands and expectations of student quality, research heft, and especially global mobility that you've talked about, global mobility of students. And I have to say 10 years later, my colleagues who built all this in between when I was at the Mellon Foundation really did deliver this. What has that done? Well, first of all, I think it's interesting to think about from the point of view of your question about the university as a whole. And well, Abu Dhabi hasn't just educated 15, 1600 wonderful undergraduates, although it has done so to spectacular effect from 115 countries or more who might never have had access to a high quality education or develop their full potential. That's a value in its own right. And I can go on and on about our students and our faculty, but I won't. I think what's really interesting to see is how the decentering of liberal arts education out of the West into this crossroads city that's quite ambitious and sits between Europe, Africa, and Asia, and really pretty far away from North and South America, although we have many American, North and South American students, how it has shifted the thinking at the mother ship in New York about what constitutes a really cosmopolitan and open-minded education uh, with students and faculty from places that maybe never ever passed through America before. And so I think really what NYU Abu Dhabi over time has done is also opened up different pathways for research and thinking about education for students who start in New York. Mm -hmm. And of course, NYU Shanghai, as you've said, our sibling started two years later, has done something very similar. And I think what's been created is these very international classes that also bring different kinds of discourse. For example, the discourse about racial inequality right. uh, that is often seen as an American problem, but actually is a global problem. Bringing that back into this region is just one example of how uh, that problem that is so present in the American discourse and system of higher education is now helping us also 
bring some change to other parts of the world and make these kinds of topics discussable. So what's often thought to be kind of a worrisome imperialist kind of colonial model turns out to be really much more interactive and reciprocal across many you know, inherited boundaries. Right, right, Mariette. I mean, it, it's, prob- it's fair to say that we used to think in the, much of the 20th century that to be international and to provide an international education, you bring in international students to North American campuses and you populate those campuses with people like you and, and me, right? Who were born and studied and grew up in other parts of the world. Um, but we now live in a global world as opposed to an international. It's no longer the US and its relation with China or the US and its relation with countries in Europe, but it's about the global perspective and having people and being out in the world. So Alan, um, has that model shifted? I mean, do you see, so I guess it's two parts. Um, Are we more effective being out there in the world in terms of our internationalization and globalization efforts? Um, You probably don't think, and I agree, that uh, we're never going to draw international students to campuses in, 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 in the United States. Uh, Do you see that dropping? I mean, how do you see the dynamics um, working, informed to some extent by what happened this past year, but also informed by what we're hearing from Marriott and, you know, NYU's approach and, you know, why it makes sense to be in Abu Dhabi and in Shanghai and have students come in from, uh, from all of those countries to study together. Thanks, uh, Safwan and Shannon and Marriott for inviting me to join you. Uh, uh, the US and US universities will still be important in our world because we have so many seats. And the biggest shortage in the world are seats in higher education, not shortages of people who are ready to go to it. And I think the magnetism of the US given its diversity of institutions, the quality of its institutions, the opportunity undergraduate and graduate will will continue. And that's been true in every pandemic. This is the 12th pandemic in IIE's history. We were founded in 1919 in the middle of the Spanish influenza. And and during uh, every pandemic, even this one, international mobility, international exchange continues. And after every pandemic is declared defeated or over, it always increases. And, and, and I think that reflects an increasing demographic of young people who seek higher education, the increasing supply of it in the United States and around the world, uh, uh, whether it's uh, something uh, like an NYU, which is a global university through a network, or the proliferation of American trained PhDs that have gone back to their home countries and offer true uh, liberal arts types of education and research education in their own in their own countries having been trained in the United States. So uh, I think what we've learned though is you really have to work at this. And again, through pandemics, uh, universities, especially US universities have sharpened their approach and appeal to international students. They've rethought their foreign, their own foreign policies to make sure they're reaching out effectively in a way to get international students from their home country to the United States or to a hybrid environment until it's safe to travel again. So after every pandemic, US higher education has actually worked harder and appreciated more the international students that are the drivers of both what American students learn about the world and what America has to offer the world through its science and technology. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating, right? I mean, I think we've, in everything that we are saying and hearing, uh, we've moved sort of from a North American centric view of the world where um, you know, it's, it's, you know, you come to us in order to learn and to learn about the world 
and um, to one where we are coming to you and we're immersing ourselves um, in the world and the value of that to our American students uh, is huge. So maybe Marriott, you can talk a little bit about the experience of the NYU students uh, who travel from Washington Square to spend time in Shanghai and in Abu Dhabi and how their experience has been impacted. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, we, we have this system whereby the students who enter NYU Abu Dhabi or NYU Shanghai or NYU New York can study in any of these sites. So that's a great advantage because if you're building a young institution like NYU Abu Dhabi, we have everything, science, engineering, uh, social science, arts and humanities. We have fabulous facilities. You see our campus, our Rafael Mioli campus behind me. It's magnificent. And we want, of course, students who are admitted in Shanghai and New York to be able to avail themselves of it. So we really have had this extremely fluid circulatory system where our students spend at least one semester, usually two semesters, in another site. Many of them love to come to New York, despite the you know, the bad rap that America got in for a while, our students still all want to go from other countries, from these 115 plus countries, they still want to go to New York. They also love going to Shanghai. And then we backfill, so to speak, those spaces with very eager students who come again from many different countries in these two other sites to us. And so, and then there are all these study away sites, just like you have in all these other countries, we have some 16 options basically for our students to study at least a semester and possibly younger. And they do come back enriched and they become an international cohort across these campuses. So when someone graduates in Shanghai, chances are our students know at least, you know, know, know these students and vice versa. And they build relationship that they carry forward into the world. So seeing that student interaction is really very beautiful. I also want to say that, of course, a big question often is, well, you know, that was, of course, in the beginning when we were starting these, these degree granting campuses in Shanghai and in Abu Dhabi, which are very different uh, environments, different jurisdictions. We were not blind to that, of course, but we took the view, if you want to have all these students come to you, as you've said, Safwan, you should also be willing to go there to know there. As, as, as Zora Neale Thurston said so famously. And if we are gonna say, until those places are just like us, we're just not gonna be able to do anything there. That's maybe a very close-minded and parochial perspective, even though academic freedom, of course, for us was a walkaway issue and we ensured that we would have it here. But the real question I was always interested in asking when someone would come to me, a faculty member or someone from the States would say, well, how can you guarantee that you can do everything in Abu Dhabi that you can do in Washington Square? I would say, listen, academic freedom, we've got that, we've discussed that, but I think it's the wrong question. I think the question is, what can we do in Abu Dhabi that we can't do in New York? And I think taking that stance that mutual and pluralistic education stance in both those sites, Shanghai and uh, Abu Dhabi has been very um, mind shifting for the university in many ways and has made us more attractive to many faculty and students. We would never have been able to recruit to New York paradoxically. Wow, wow. So one of the things that I know you can do in Abu Dhabi that you can do less of in New York, correct me if I'm wrong, is you're able to offer a lot of scholarship and financial aid to international students, not only to local Emirati students, um, which brings up the um, issue of the cost of higher education, which has been skyrocketing uh, at the best research institutions in North America uh, that are most sought after. Um, we sometimes, I worry that we bring in a certain class of international students who can afford our universities and all the uh, extra costs associated uh, with attending a university, say in New York, for an international student. Um, we've seen this year the shift to virtual education, which I want to come back to and see what we think, what the two of you think uh, about the potential that that has created. 
Um, but one of the issues that it has brought into focus uh, is the question of equity. And here I have a question from an alumni um, of Columbia University and a dear friend and the mother of a college student who's currently enrolled at Columbia, uh, Lena Papele Zompulu. Um, I've done my best, Lena, so I hope I did not butcher your name. Uh, Lena asks, pre-virtual higher education courses are becoming a reality. They will increase globalization and inclusion. However, there are many that foresee that um, the higher education market will split in two major segments. Um, few high quality academic institutions that will continue offering traditional, mostly in-person education, um, or a number of virtual hybrid part-time education providers of lower caliber. Uh, in this case, the privileged wealthy uh, who will have access to the former will benefit disproportionately fueling increased inequalities the way that Lena sees it. Um, what do you think of this view? And if so, what can be done to mitigate uh, this dangerous development? So on the one hand, you've got the in-person on campus and the course associated with it. We now know that we're going to be relying more on virtual education. So I guess it's a two-part question. How do we find the right balance? What do you think we've learned from this past year that will inform how we model education going forward? And has virtual learning created greater inequities uh, because of, um, of what we've been seeing? Alan, would you like to take a first crack at that? I, I think one of the silver linings was that we, of the pandemic is we have all learned that universities as we know them are not gonna be replaced. Uh, people at whatever sector of society and whatever level of education want something that happens uh, on a campus. Uh, they want something that happens in a lab on a campus. They want something that happens after class on a campus through extracurricular and co-curricular activities. And, and, and those, it turns out, are as much a part of the learning process and what attracts people to universities around the world as what you can do online. We also know we can do a lot more online. So we'll be living in a hybrid environment for a, a very long time and and each university will find a different way to address the inequities that come with getting people to campus and also come with providing the bandwidth and the technology so that if they can't get to campus they'll be able to get some of the learning through technology but but the university as we know it at NYU or at Columbia uh, that form, there's a reason it's been around for a thousand years uh, and, and that it will persist. And it has persisted not only through the 20th century pandemics, but pandemics that stretch far back into human history. So uh, I, I think we just have to make sure that we're reaching out as, as equally and as best as we can to find all the students that want to get higher education and a place for them and, right. and there are enough universities especially in the united states that we could right and people sometimes forget that the technology that we're using now has been around for a long time i mean um so and and it, it has the university has proven to be um in a way irreplaceable i like uh, i like what you what you said alan and technology can supplement but not replace the value of uh, the on-campus. Alan, what about the issue of, do you worry um, in your role as head of the Institute for International Education, do you worry about international students being able to afford our great universities? Do you worry that we're not doing enough uh, perhaps to provide financial aid to international students so that we can get a greater cross-section of uh, socioeconomic strata uh, or students who come from diverse socioeconomic strata? I, I worry about costs for everybody, including American students. Uh, and I worry about the disinvestment of uh, uh, our 50 states in their own university systems, which has caused the cost of public education to continue to rise beyond the reach of, of many Americans. But, but Interestingly, the, the two questions I get asked the most are, 
one, can I get a shot? And two, will I get shot? Mm. And, and the biggest issue coming to America is the, is the availability of vaccine um, and the home country that a student is coming from or the availability on a campus. And the second is gun violence once they get to America. And those questions come up far more often than uh, the cost, uh, because it turns out, uh, especially at the research universities, uh, they're one of the few sectors of US higher education that has scholarships for international students. And because they do have scholarships, they're able to draw from many different sectors of society. And we're learning as we do that, that, uh, that, that students from the poorest of backgrounds can excel at our higher education institutions, uh, win Nobel prizes, patent new drugs and new technologies, and that we need this as part of helping humankind advance in science and technology. So uh, I, I wish there were a way to solve the cost problem generally and not just in specific to international students. It's mm. a very, very good point. Marriott, anything to add? And then I want to follow up with you, Marriott, about something that Alan has just brought about, which is rising violence and tensions. We should talk about that. But the question about technology, I think, is a very important one and is itself the use of it, the great, great silver or golden lining of this pandemic. We can do this right now. I might not have had this discussion with the two of you for another five years, you know, if we didn't have this. So this is already very rich and we have 250 people tuning in, which I think is incredible. You wouldn't have been able to do it, right? Most of the time in an online, in an in-person setting. But of course we're talking about the quality of education and another real uh, positive of the very difficult experience of in two weeks, every university on earth having to take all of its courses online is that we did it. We showed it could be done. Until this time, institutions like my own and yours and many other high quality institutions put off to the side Coursera or edX or something else or Udacity to just dabbled a little bit. But mostly, most of us blue chip institutions went kicking or screaming. And then when we had to do it, guess what? We could do it and it wasn't perfect, but it got better very quickly because we have wonderful centers for teaching and learning that saved all of us, I think. I mean, hail to these incredible staffers, the academic technologists, and these people in the Centers for Teaching and Learning who are often sort of undervalued. Well, not anymore, I would say. And I think that's been a great and magnificent thing. You referenced my work uh, trying to improve access to uh, community college students, giving them access to high quality education when I was at Mellon. And we have an equity mission at MBU Abu Dhabi, as I've said, we try to close that opportunity gap for students from around the world who really are very socioeconomically diverse in our case, because we have the ability to do it. That's lucky. But of course, we need to go beyond that and to reach the full population of people who really would benefit and seek a university education. We know they would benefit from it and don't have access today. The online is and the hybrid are going to have to play very fundamental roles, much more so than they've had in the past. Uh, you both know about the University of the People, the free online university for people who don't have any alternative. Shai Rashef, who founded it, if you were sitting it here with us, would say, Mariette, this is not the education you want for your kids. This is not the best that can be had. Of course not, but it is more than anyone had who goes to this university today. And they're finding transfer abilities after getting a complete asynchronous online degree in computer science or business. Those are their basic fields because they're very needed around the world, but they go on to other universities. They have transfer, transfer arrangements with McGill University. Yes. Uh, with, with others. And so I think it's really important for the universities like ours not to be snobbish, not to be elitist and to say, how can we strengthen this? How can we help? And how can we learn from them to make education more adaptable and flexible for our own students who probably sometimes find us a little bit persnickety about how you can get to that 
four year degree and you miss one calculus course, you should be able to make it up during the summer, I think, online. So I learned that from my work with community colleges that they're much more flexible about still getting a decent education to their students to get them through. And I think if there's anything I've learned during the pandemic is that the great universities like ours that are valued in person and it is so important that there are ways we can hybridize and really strengthen education for many, many more students than the system currently supports. Thank you, Marianne. And I'm so glad you brought up University of the People and the work of Shaira Chef. And uh, uh, I mean, it's amazing what this university has been able to do in terms of providing access to large swaths of society and especially marginalized um, swaths mm -hmm. of society. So the programming that is being done, for example, in the Arabic language that's targeting Syrian refugees in particular, uh, but is open more broadly, uh, is just magnificent. And then the ability to, as you said, uh, continue with their education at places like McGill. So the bottom line, I mean, what I'm hearing from both of you is uh, it's not one size fits all and it's not all uh, either or, right? I mean, you know, there is a place and there is a time for different modalities. Let's turn to the issue of violence before we- if Just, just we say, if, if yeah. the universities don't start with an international view, that if they don't start with the dream to have global centers or be a global network, if they don't start with their own foreign policies, uh, by themselves, they're not going to get into the 21st century. And that's true for American colleges and universities, but not all of whom uh, have an international strategy. Yeah. It's true for universities around the world, not all of whom welcome people from other countries or different right. than their own. Uh, right. so maybe the pandemic uh, and our three experiences uh, bring home the need to have people leading institutions that, that, that are international, um, and, and have international in their bones. Absolutely, it is a mindset. It is a mindset. And, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of tensions, right? Political tensions. If we can just spend a couple of minutes on particularly U.S. Sino tensions and um, NYU with the campus in Shanghai, we have a global center in Beijing. Um, you know, we students worry about anti Asian and anti-Asian American violence that we have seen an uptick in in the United States. It's not only anti-Asian. I mean, you know, the, the anti-Black and anti-Brown uh, violence um, has seen a peak uh, in the history uh, under the, the previous administration. Um, Anti-Semitic um, uh, violence and, and, and racism uh, saw an all-time high in uh, 2019. Um, how, you know, what's our responsibility as a university to counter those forces? So, for example, you know, when I travel in China, which I haven't done in more than a year now, uh, there's always a meeting of the minds of people like us, educators, who say we have an added, you know, we have an increased responsibility to have academics work together, to have students interact with one another, to sort of counter what political leadership may be trying to do um, to divide us. So, you know, there are multi layers to this, right? You know, and, and, and I'd love to get your views on what we can do to counter this. And I'm going to hear reference um, the president of Columbia, Lee Bollinger, who wrote a piece in the Washington Post a couple of years ago that I know the two of you have seen when he said, no, I won't start spying on my foreign born students, which was in reaction to the Trump administration, the Justice Department, trying to recruit universities um, to report on Chinese scholars and students in particular. So I would love to get your thoughts on all of this. Well, let me start. Uh, you, you've raised a, a large basket of issues. Let's start with China for a moment. So um, 
China is obviously a rising global power. It's undeniable and uh, the world is beginning to come to some kind of grips with it or is going to have to. Um, I see, do I think it's entirely possible that Chinese students, some are tasked to spy? It's entirely possible, just as historically, students in other, from other countries, from the UK to the US to probably my own country, the Netherlands of birth, have also been tasked to spy. I think it's a small subset is what I would say. So I feel that the assumption that somehow we have to assume that students from China in our communities are already spies is extremely dangerous. And I see it as a version of the anti-Asian sort of discrimination, stereotyping, and frankly, racism that we've seen such an uptick in, but that is an old story that is just, you know, that, that somehow has been uh, exacerbated partly by the rise of China as a global economic power. Kind of the question, who gets to be rich, right? It comes, yeah. comes, to, comes to mind there. But also then the very unfortunate overlay onto the, the first manifestation of the coronavirus that somehow seems to have given a lot of people latitude to ramp up these kinds of attacks and turn them into actual physical attacks uh, of, that are absolutely harrowing. So as universities, what's our responsibility? Make it discussable. We are learning communities. We can learn from each other. We can stage uh, discussion and debate. We can certainly hold vigils as Emily Abrabi has done for various communities the past year to recognize that this is just not on if you are a liberal arts minded or any kind of institution of education. After, edu after all, education is not just to get people to a better job, although that's important and to economic security, although that's important, it's also to help form perspective, a sense of self, a sense of oneself in relation to other human beings, other living creatures and our, our place on the planet. And so I think universities have a high responsibility, whether they are vocational tech colleges or R1 research universities to really make these matters discussable and bring the full resources from within our community, our learning communities to the table to, to really seek truth and not let rhetoric and you know, this kind of fiction parading as sort of truth uh, overtake um, this kind of a discourse. Uh, so I, yeah, no, I, we're, we're doubling down on this at NYU and certainly at NYU Abu Dhabi as well. That's great. That's great. Very well said. Alan? We, we, we need to keep academic doors open uh, more than ever. And they've never been more important to do that, especially after pandemics. Uh, there, there are silver linings to pandemics, as I've mentioned, but uh, there, not, not everything is bright after every one of the 20th century pandemics, uh, all the isms that we have been fighting and that caused wars seem to have strengthened. Nazism, fascism, isolationism, fundamentalism, populism, uh, and, and that's happening today. And Thucydides, when he first wrote about the plague of Athens thousands of years ago, said the first instinct is, uh, is exclusion. The yeah. first instinct is to build barriers, keep people out, uh, thinking that will make one safe. We know it doesn't. Uh, and, and I think we need to be as universities on the front lines of showing that academic doors can and should be open all through the kinds of crises we face. Uh, because the moment you close your door, you're closing your mind. And it allows these isms, which uh, for which there seems to be no vaccine, uh, there seems to be no cure. Uh, it allows them to strengthen and with, with terrible political consequences. And, and they last a long time. And I think the isms today of fascism and populism and fundamentalism and xenophobism are going to last a lot longer than COVID-19. Yep, yep, yep. I was actually very fortunate, um, Marriott, uh, to be hosted by the Times Higher Education Conference that you hosted at NYU Abu Dhabi last week, virtually. And when I spoke about uh, knowledge diplomacy, I made the point um, that the university may very well be uh, the last bastion 
of diplomacy in the world today. Um, and so I consider people like you, Marriott, you, Alan, you, Shannon, and myself incredibly fortunate uh, to be doing the work that we are doing. Mm -hmm. Shannon, uh, thank you for your patience and the students' patience. We could go on forever. Um, yes, Marriott, we can do this virtually very easily, but we, what we are missing um, is the ability to go out and have dinner with one another yes. after yes. this talk. Yeah, yes. But hopefully that day will, will come soon. Um, or iftar, um, since uh, today is the first day of Ramadan. It's her time um, now. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so Shannon, I know that we have a couple of students who would like to post questions on camera. And I know that you have other questions from other students and members of our global audience. So allow me to turn it over to you, Shannon. Yes, thank you. And what a really amazing conversation so far. Um, Sophia Almeida is our first student and Sophia is here with us live today. Sophia, why don't you introduce yourself and go ahead and ask your question of the panel. Panelists, my name is Sophia Olmeda, and I am a first year here at Columbia, so currently hoping to study civil engineering. And my question is for any of the panelists, and it's how do you expect higher education institutions to evolve in order to address the topic of climate change? Do you feel that there needs to be some precaution in how and what particularly universities are covering when addressing climate change and sustainability? Mm. Amazing how students are now starting yes. their uh, career thinking about these huge issues um, that our generations basically created <laughs> as problems. And uh, Sophia, it's a terrific question. Uh, Marriott, you want to start? Absolutely. Sophia, thanks so much for the question. Like you, I, I surmise uh, our students are, for, forgive the, the metaphor, they're on fire about this issue. It is so important. And I see it as an absolutely critical priority for our institution. We are in an, in an oil dependent economy that's rapidly diversifying, but it's also an economy and a country that has a minister of climate change because they are so worried about this, climate change and the environment. So they are, there are no deniers here at all. So uh, I think the moment has come where many universities now see climate change and certainly ours is no exception. NYU as a global institution is no exception, sees climate change as an absolutely cross-cutting matter, not just for the environmental scientists, not just for the energy economists and the, tra the, you know, the, the offset people, not just for the facilities people, not just for the student interest groups and the activists, but something that needs to be grounded into our research and our uh, curricular cultures as a topic that universities are supremely well called upon to address because we are in theory universal. We, we work from the STEM fields all the way across the social sciences to the arts and humanities. And a problem of this grave a threat, the habitability of the planet and the survival of humans and other living things is at stake. It is the gravest threat to the planet, I believe, and I think many people would agree with this probably, since the rise of Homo sapiens, and Homo sapiens happens to be largely responsible for it. So this is something we have to address. We cannot keep siloizing it. We have to deal with it at the level of system and the level of individual person, person responsibility and personal stewardship. So we just appointed our first ever overarching uh, director for environmental sustainability and stewardship who will pull together this magnificent faculty research in all these different areas that we have from you know math modeling to coral reef to um, to uh, building materials that aren't so taxing on the environment as concrete and so on and so forth to what the students like to do and have been doing in terms of education to uh, our public programs to our actual facilities and our actual carbon footprint stop with all the printing, reduce the air travel. The, the, the pandemic has shown us that we can do it up to a point. So I think that that's the new wave. You're gonna see this kind of cross-cutting work in leading universities, signing on to serious climate 
goals, which is what you have to do to get there, as NYU has done. I think that's sort of the wave of the future. And frankly, it's the wave of now, I feel, because our students are rightly demanding this. Thank you, Mariette. Alan? I think Mariette's got it just right. We have to be the, the we have to be the change we want change to be. And that means in our workplace, in our institutions, in our habits, in our travel. I also think we may be fortunate that this is suddenly not a generational thing, Sophia. It's not your generation against our generation. Because we just lived through a year uh, where we all noticed how good it was to breathe the air. Uh, we just lived through a year in cities where people had less colds uh, due to particles in the air. Even people in China probably have experienced less air pollution uh, caused by man-made factors. And, and maybe it's the first time that all of our generations are united saying, you know, that, that was a pretty good year for the garden, pretty good year for flowering plants, pretty good year for not so many automobiles on the road, pretty good year for not so many airplanes in, in the skies. And maybe it makes a difference to keep it like that. And that's what I hope uh, it, we, we together across generations will take away. Because if we don't get this right, uh, there's not much left. Yep. And Sophia, um, I'd love for you to learn more also about the climate school, uh, which we announced this year and which will be taking its first cohort of students uh, this coming fall. Um, this is a huge development for us at Columbia. And it's the first new school in decades. Uh, I don't know how many decades, but probably uh, since the 1940s or 50s when we launched the um, School of General Studies, International Public Affairs, and professional, sure. School of Professional Studies. Um, and leading the new climate school is the director of the Earth Institute, uh, Sir Alex Halliday, uh, whom we brought from Oxford a few years ago in order to run the Earth Institute and with uh, President Bollinger's leadership, uh, this new school has now been um, studied uh, and announced, and the Earth Institute will be uh, part of the new climate school. And it also speaks to something that you've heard Alan and Marriott um, and myself speak about, and that is the role of the university beyond the walls of the university, okay? Um, and, you know, we've been talking a lot at Columbia about the fourth purpose of the university. The three traditional purposes or missions of a university are education, research, and service. And now increasingly, as you heard from Marriott about the work that they're doing on climate, it's about impact. It's about impact and directed action and working with governmental and non-governmental institutions around the world to impact change. So... Thank you, Sophia, for the question. And uh, maybe um, with through your work in civil engineering, you'll also be um, engaged in some of the activities at Columbia on, on climate. Shannon? Yes, thank you, thank you Sophia. Much. Excellent question. So our next question is from Anna Nuttall. And I guess Anna had a few technical challenges today. So we have Paulo Musto, who's here with us also. Hi, Anna, we thank you for joining us. I see that you are online live, uh, but I know that you had a technical problem with your microphone. So Paulo is gonna ask the question. Paulo is a graduate assistant in the collaboratory. He's a master's student in Columbia School of International Public Affairs studying economics and political development. Paulo and other facilitators have been working with students to develop questions around this topic and other global challenges. So Paulo, Anna, do you want to try your microphone for one second? No? Okay, you've tried. Okay. <laughs> Paolo, Sorry. you're representing Anna. <laughs> yes, Anna, thank you for being here and having your camera on. Uh, so Anna's question is, how does growing awareness of supporting students' mental health exert influence on the functioning of higher education? So I jump in? I thank you so much for that question. I think it is so important and vital, um, both of you, Anna and Paolo, to raise it. So I think, as Alan has said, the pandemic has, of course, confronted us with all these realities that were already there, whether it's climate change or equal access to healthcare, 
or the growing challenges of mental health for university students. And what we learned certainly this year was it wasn't just university students, it's also faculty and staff. And so I think in many institutions, including my own, we had already begun, before we knew the word coronavirus, we'd begun to work on ramping up support in this part of the world that's a little bit challenging, but working with NYU as a global institution, we've always prioritized it. But what really has changed, and I think this is a good thing, is that because all of us felt more vulnerable, we're all a little bit more open to change and to these conversations, right? And so I think um, as we began to see that our faculty and staff too were feeling exhausted and overworked and challenged in so many ways. You can imagine on our campus where so many people are not actually from Abu Dhabi, they haven't been home home, although this is also our home in a very long time. We realized we really had to make these resources available and above all, remove the stigma and say, it's okay. And so the important thing to do maybe is not just to think about mental health. And usually when people talk about mental health, they're talking about mental sickness or illness, right? And that's important to address, of course, but there's a whole spectrum of well-being where you're just not really, where you're out of sorts and that can spiral quickly to other kinds of conditions that traditionally would be dealt with in a mental health framework as it's existed. I think the shift that we saw was we began to create a much wider spectrum of services, partly by outsourcing and telemedicine, but just in general, working with a really good organization to say, it's okay just to go for a university supported mental health check-in just like you go for a checkup, you know, with your doctor when there's nothing wrong with you, but you're just feeling a little bit uncertain. And I think making mental health discussable in new ways is, has been a benefit of the pandemic, even though it is terrible how much more people have suffered in isolation and uncertainty. But I do think overall, the upside is that we now all realize we really have to provide these resources and I think uh, faculty have become much more aware that sometimes if a student isn't performing as they were used to or don't come to class, that it is actually our responsibility not to be a mental health professional, but to help the student get help and so forth. So I'm hoping that that will be a lasting effect, this greater openness. That's great. Maybe I could offer a somewhat personal answer to that question as well. Uh, our, our daughter is a physician and uh, was trained in medicine at, at Columbia um, and went from Columbia to a federal community health center where the population is stressed uh, by all kinds of issues, uh, undocumentation, immigration, refugee status. Uh, uh, and she would see 20 patients a day in clinic uh, all of whom had medical problems. Uh, and the good news is that the federal centers exist to diagnose and treat these problems. Uh, she then worked for five years uh, helping to run a health center at a research university. Uh, to my surprise, uh, her patient load in clinic was the same, 20 a day, 19 of which had mental problems. Mm. So here are way before the pandemic, students at a top university uh, not having traditional medical problems, but having an enormous caseload of mental problems that needed referrals, that needed treatment. And, and it sort of woke us both up to, this is part of what universities way before the pandemic have to be prepared to do and, and to have the mental resources as well as the clinical resources to treat and help students across the whole spectrum. I think it's only gotten worse with the pandemic. Uh, and I think if you, as she once did a, did a survey of US higher education institutions, how many have health services and what are the qualifications of the staff, you would find very few uh, psychiatrists. You'd find uh, an acute shortage of the ability to refer students to the, the medical help they need in the psychiatric area. Uh, and I'm sure this is persistent. So uh, 
And I think the pandemic has stressed how important this is, but it was a problem way before the pandemic happened. Yes, and I, this was a very important question. We appreciate you joining us today to ask it. And I wanted to point out that Anna is actually in New York, originally from Arkansas. She's a student in Columbia College majoring in Russian. And we really appreciate the global dimensions of your interest in your major. So thank you for joining us. We have another question from a student. Uh, and I'm gonna ask Paolo to ask this question on behalf of Jen Beardsley. Yes, thank you, Shannon. Our next question comes from Jen Beardsley. Jen is from Chicago and she's majoring in evolutionary biology. Her question is, as some public schools in the United States are moving away from standardized testing and instead focusing on projects that show students mastery of topics, what is the future of standardized testing, both as a way to pass classes in school and a way to show colleges, trade schools, and, and employers a level of academic achievement? It's a great and pressing topic for higher education. There is this, and I think it extends to the SAT and the ACT and the GMAT and all of that. Interestingly, standardized testing was created as an equalizer. That was the goal. The idea was that, you know, this was kind of an invention, I think of the military in the 1940s or so, the SAT, uh, that, you know, that it could help level the playing field. If you, it didn't matter what school you went to, but you could just test people on these kind of uh, very standards of, of, of knowledge about math and English. But of course, we've all come to know that it sort of in the end has had this very ill effect because if you didn't go to the right schools, you might not be able to have to prep for the tests. And basically what these tests, some people, some critics would say, I'm not as extreme as this, but some critics would say, the test measures the ability to take that test which is obviously a test that you'll never again have to take in college, let alone when you're in a job. So this is where the critique of standard testing comes from, I think. On the one hand, it has, it has been shown to be not equitable in the way it measures ability. That ability is always uh, inflected by one's upbringing. It isn't all nature. There's a heck of a lot of nurture and environment and, and, and even deleterious effects. Uh, on in, in upbringing that, you know, that just mean that some people are never going to get the top scores. And so that's kind of one of the critiques of it. The positive aspect of the critique is that it's focused everyone on progressive modes of assessment, which I've always been very interested in. And so these are the more about what Jen was referring to in her question, the kind of portfolio type assessment the kind of more, more holistic assessment of what does a person do with the material that person gets in an education? How can a person transform that into the outcomes you see into the world? Of course, ideally, this is what we do. Scaling it is very, very difficult. Although here again, I think the challenges around online education and, and testing and cheating, whatever it was worried about, remember, has forced people to think more about how you can assess more creatively for real, um, real achievement. One of Columbia's great, uh, Lisa Anderson, the former Dean of the School of Professional and International Studies, who also was then the president of the American University of Cairo, just last week at this conference where Safon gave his wonderful keynote that he mentioned, the Times Higher Education uh, MENA University Summit, she said, well, you know, think about it. Uh, these 30 page research papers even, or these multiple choice tests, most of my students will never ever have to take those again. And I really sort of took something away from that. So I think your question is absolutely apt. Can we assess more holistically and more in a way that maps onto what people are going to go be doing into the world? That's very important. I think in terms of skill and resources, uh, it will probably be a very unequal landscape as to how we, how we can get there. Thank you, Marriott. Thank you, Marriott. Um, I think we'll move on. We have so many questions from the global audience. I wanna acknowledge that many had that same question about standardized testing. So Jess Kim, we saw your question. I hope that Marriott was able to answer it. Uh, I wanna move on to a question about the role of philanthropy uh, and perhaps Alan and Marriott especially, 
you might want to weigh in on this question from Frederico Menino, uh, who this was one of many his questions, but this one focuses on what do you think will be the role and impacts of philanthropies and reshaping the landscape of international higher education in future years and decades? And I know you both have some interesting perspectives to share on that. Alan, you start. <laughs> yes. So we, we had the privilege at IIE of administering a very large scholarship on behalf of the Ford Foundation for people in 22 different countries over a 10 year period who were denied education because of their gender, their physical attributes, their religion, their ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic status, and the scholarship, 5,000 of them were for, for those people to go to graduate school. Uh, and we made a huge mistake. Uh, they did just fine. Uh, we found people who picked garbage uh, for their family in Indonesia and Brazil who were top students when they finished their higher education. We had no short, we had 100,000 applications in China uh, from women and people born in the wrong part of China. Uh, we had no problem finding terrific students. The mistake we made was not saying to the universities where we placed them that if you take a fully paid for scholarship student under this program, you need to commit after the program's over to keep looking for that student. And it would have been an easy ask at the time and many universities took hundreds of these students, uh, again, fully paid, fully compensated by the gift of the foundation. And, and we missed not saying, okay, this will prove to you that students from all walks of life can make terrific students. Uh, and when it's over, you need to commit to finding the same students because that's the applicant pool you're not searching. That's the applicant pool you're missing. So I, I hope we will have philanthropy in the future that has an edge like this, that says, oh, if we're gonna do it, uh, when it's over, you need to commit as the institution to broaden and level the playing field. Maria, do you wanna well, add? I, as you heard, worked for nine years in philanthropy and oversaw grant making for a major uh, American uh, philanthropy. So most of our grant making was in the US. We're on the US tax, we're a US tax exempt institution and worked on many issues of equity and redress, including with Columbia University and its wonderful prison education program and so forth. Um, and so I would say no longer being in philanthropy, but of course seeking philanthropy. I hope philanthropy will continue to play a major role in international education. But I also came away with a little humility, I have to say. I was very enthusiastic about the work of uh, helping support the Scholar Rescue Fund, helping ref support refugee education, helping support transforming the educational systems in South Africa, uh, Uganda and Ghana. The truth is those dollars are only gonna go so far. And for the most part, you can make exemplary grants to model institutions like the American, the Asian University for Women, which I adore and think is a very strong equity redressing private institution in Bangladesh. But it, you know, it really is hard to do it at scale. And so I would say philanthropy alone can never do it, even though we need more of it and people should be generous and philanthropic if they can be, in my view. Uh, at all skills and at all levels, I think in the end, it's all about partnerships. Philanthropy can set directions, really promote new practices, stay with uh, institutions that try to do work and real leaders, pick leaders who do it. But in the end, you need governments to come up behind it with their tax base, and you need middle-class families that can afford it, be willing to co-invest in education. It doesn't, it shouldn't all be for free for everybody but it should be free for a whole lot more people. That's how I would put it. Yeah. Let me add to that by saying, uh, you know, philanthropy starts at home, right? Um, so what can we do philanthropically to help? And um, 
you know, as, as Alan knows intimately, when we started the program across the entire university to place displaced students in the classroom, um, when I went out to all 18 schools and affiliates of the university, every single head um, of those units came back and said, I will take care of at least one such student. I'll waive all of their expenses. And some of them have said, uh, we will also contribute to their living expenses. And it's fantastic. This year we have the, our inaugural cohort of 18 students that I hope, Paolo, Sofia, Anna, um, you get to interact with uh, because nothing can enrich the experience um, of uh, students than you know, coming into contact uh, with students, not only from all over the world, but those who have had a particularly interesting and arduous journey getting to our institutions. Uh, let me, I just wanna pick up on one question um, that Anissa Bouzian uh, has put in the Q&A function. Uh, you know, and I'm guilty of this all the time. When we talk about the global and the international, we talk about outside of the United States. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves that the United States is part of that globe that we are thinking about and we're talking about. So, you know, our global centers are all outside of the US borders, but we've often thought and toyed with the idea, shouldn't we have global centers in the United States, in the South, uh, in other parts of the country to gain a better understanding and to contribute and provide uh, opportunities for learning and cross learning. So um, I'd love either of you, Alan or Marriott, to, um, to tell us um, what you think. I think it's a dynamite idea and very much needed in a country where most citizens still don't have a passport. Uh, and one of the things the pandemic has taught us is if you can't do study abroad, uh, there is the possibility to study another culture and speak its language and eat its food and interact with its people right here at home. And so internationalization at home, globalization at home, uh, given how diverse our country is and how large it is, it is another way of getting at this. But, but I, I, I think there are parts of America and parts of American cities that would lend itself to your global centers just as much as uh, uh, any place you, you have abroad. Would NYU, Marriott, think of, uh, in addition to Abu Dhabi and Shanghai, maybe a Washington DC campus or an Alabama campus? Uh... Well, you know, what we like to say, and it really was so important during the pandemic, I think the point is great, by the way, that Anissa has raised for all the reasons that, that Alan said, but, but, you know, the sun never sets on an NYU classroom or lab these days, because we really do have sites everywhere, including in, these are study sites with many, many students and researchers. So they're, 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 they're not degree granting, but they are these sites where our students all go and faculty. Los Angeles is one. Washington DC is another, and you can imagine they have special and different characters. So if you're interested in film industry, maybe you wanna to go to Los Angeles if you're interested in politics or how our government organizes itself or not, you go to Washington or in journalism, Washington might be very interesting. But I think there's also a component to your question that's about equity that really interested me. And I want to say that again, through the work with community colleges, I, I learned so much and had such international and intercultural exposure by going to places like El Paso and working with the University of Texas in El Paso, which is a very mission-driven institution in that system, works very closely with the Community College of El Paso. And you know, a third of the students just about in those institutions commute every day mm. from uh, Ciudad Juarez across the way. So this is really interesting to think about. And they organize curriculum against, around these experiences and expose different segments of the population. And students in Texas come from many different communities. So intercultural education is everywhere in the United States. This is one of the sources of hope for the country is in fact the reality that people are only just one generation or half a generation often away from very different places 
where their elders or their siblings had come from. And so I think this is a real opportunity. And you see, you see schools doing it, high schools. Here's a high school in New York that I've served on the board of. They couldn't compete with Trinity School or these schools that were where the kids all went abroad for spring break and things like that. They didn't have the endowment or resources. They created a sort of an 11th grade program where all year they worked in groups and they could go to different places in the United States, a refugee center and resettlement community in Kentucky. They went to Maine, to the depleted community in Maine. They went to uh, certain cultural uh, communities in Florida and so forth. So they created study abroad at home. It can totally be done. And I think it's a real possibility for creating access to the intercultural learning that in the end is the point of all this global mobility. It isn't only the food, although the food is a good part of it. Yeah, always is. Always is. I think the politics... Especially with soft one. <laughs> <laughs> The politics of the past few years in, in America, I think, have also made it even a necessity um, that we look within our borders. Shannon, back to you. Yes, Maybe I, I, I appreciate your comments so much. I'm from South Texas. And so that yeah. idea that you're having intercultural experiences in our global communities in the U.S. is right spot on with what we try to talk about in the Center for Undergraduate Global Engagement. So one last question we want to squeeze in. We talked about climate change, but Anupam Saraf had a question regarding preparing students for global challenges, commenting on the global need to create generations that can address the increasing planetary challenges of our times. This is really a, 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 an appropriate question because it really embodies what we're trying to do with the collaboratory. So challenges such as the pandemic, ecological destruction, other types of emergencies, uh, understanding what role does higher education have in training students to address global challenges. Uh, Alan, would you like to handle that one? I'd like to solve that problem. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think every U.S. higher education institution should require every student attending it arriving with a passport. And if they don't have a passport, help them get it. We're gonna to try to help uh, 10,000 students uh, in the next year's American citizens get a passport because so many simply don't. And, and if you don't start with a passport, you're never going to think about the world beyond your borders. There are plenty of opportunities once we can travel again to help students and finance their study abroad. Uh, and some places are lucky like NYU because NYU is in the world, as is Columbia. Uh, but in terms of our citizenry, uh, more than 60% of Americans don't have a passport. And the worrisome thing is that half of those who do are over the age of 60. So the passport is not linked to education. It's not linked to getting ready to be a citizen of the world. And I, I, I think this is one thing we can do for all of our students and we ought to. Right. I would agree. I think both Alan's institution, more than hundred years young now, and my own just 10 years or so young, uh, were created for the purpose of making a better world through international collaboration. That's very true of this NY Abu Dhabi. Uh, campus. Uh, and how do we do it? I think one critical way to do it is to pay attention to what has been happening uh, in the best universities and colleges, but increasingly lesser resource institutions are also onto this. They can, they can also be really outstanding institutions, by the way. It's not all about resources, although resources help. And that is undergraduate research. Columbia is a wonderful case in point. You have a, the collaboratory is a wonderful case in point as I'm learning about it this evening, for me the evening. Um, I think undergraduate research, certainly at NYU is utterly structured around tackling problems in capstones, also shining a light on what's great, by the way. We yeah. sometimes begin to think that education is only about preparing people for a depressing world. 
It's not. It's also about reminding us of what humans are capable of and shining a light on that. But again, undergraduate research, which is just flourishing at so many institutions and can be done at so many levels, all the way up to capstone research. All our students do a capstone thesis or a project. And seeing what those students do together in engineering, in art, or across disciplines is truly dazzling to me and gives me a lot of hope that indeed our students will be better prepared than ever actually to be socially engaged into the world and bringing their capacities to tackling these really, really hard problems. Because you can't tackle them all at once. It's going to take all little bits and pieces and a lot of human creativity to do it. But uh, research is really a key, I believe. This has been so much fun. It's been incredible. So informative, so instructive. And if I were, just before I turn it over to Shannon, uh, to sum it up maybe in one sentence, the future of higher education is bright, but it is also one that is innovative, that is adaptable, that is relevant, and it is our responsibility to make sure that it is all of those things. And to Sophia's question, that it is impactful. Um, impactful not only through the student experiences, and the research that we conduct by how, but by how we take that research out into the world. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Shannon. Alan and Marriott, it's so much fun to see you and to be in conversation with you. And next time, maybe we will do it at Fakhreddin restaurant in Amman, uh, where I find with each of you uh, at, and maybe we broadcast from there and Shannon can come and join us uh, for a festive uh, meal. I can't thank you enough, really. Shannon, over to you. Thank sure. you, Juan. Well, I've truly enjoyed this engaging discussion about one of the most pressing concerns in the world today, the future of higher education. We've talked about everything from how students interact and build community to interact in a globally interconnected world, the shifting of universities to deliver education around the world, the cost and quality of higher education, virtual learning versus traditional in-person education, how we model education going forward and inequalities in higher ed, and so much more. As I mentioned earlier, this is the third seminar of the Spring Global Columbia, Columbia Collaboratory, excuse me, a virtual exchange platform that brings Columbia students, thought leaders, and educators from around the globe together to reflect, ideate, and collaborate to make an impact. We are looking forward to our next collaboratory seminar. So please keep an eye out for the announcement. I also want to remind Columbia undergraduate students joining us today that the next application deadline for the collaboratory is April 26. And this will be to participate in the summer cohort. Thanks again to our esteemed panelists who joined us today, Alan Goodman and Mariette Westerman. Many thanks to the team at the Columbia Global Centers, Columbia World Projects, Columbia College and the Center for Undergraduate Global Engagement. And of course, we wanna extend a very special thank you to our amazing collaboratory students from around the world, partners and participants, um, uh, members of our global audience. A reminder that a, think to, a link to the recording of the full seminar will be sent to everyone who registered. And for others, you'll be able to find it in our website. Thank you and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.